And we looked yesterday at some questions that often arise, always arise on this subject, challenges that come up uh, when the subject of contemporary music is discussed. And we want to finish that this afternoon. And the uh, next question is, what is wrong with soft rock? What's wrong with soft rock? Well, we know the hard rock's wrong. We really, you know, that grinding stuff, that industrial stuff, that thrashing stuff, that is, uh, we, we don't want that. But, but what about the soft rock? And the, uh, uh, sh surely that's not all wrong. And I want to answer that because I believe a lot of independent Baptists do listen to soft rock. First of all, the message uh, of soft rock is, is often as, as immoral as hard rock. It always has been. It promotes, a set, uh, it always from the 50s has promoted a sensual, lustful relationships that are not grounded in marriage. God made sex and, and, and it's a wonderful thing, but it's for marriage. But the love that rockers sing about, it's all about love, of course, they sing about love, but it's not a love defined by the Bible, it's more lust, uh, uh, is, is the definition of rock and roll love, not defined by God's standards, and it's very dangerous to allow our minds to dwell on that type of thing. The Bible says, in fact, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as become of saints. So we're not to have anything with, to do with that. And secondly, even soft rock uses the sexy rhythms, the sensual rhythms that appeal to the flesh that we've been discussing this week. In, uh, in the history, I've, I've read many histories of the blues and jazz that predated rock and roll. And one of those books is called Memphis Beat. Memphis, of course, was a, 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 a place where the blues was one of the birthplaces of the blues before rock and roll. Memphis and Beale Street is still a famous place, a pilgrimage place for those uh, uh, going into the past of this music and uh, doing historical studies. And Larry Nager, the author of this book, says, The Forbidden Pleasures of Beale Street Forbidden pleasures of Beale Street were gambling and fornication or whatever, had always come wrapped in the pulsing rhythms of the blues. And so the, that, that rhythm, he's not talking about the words, he's talking about the rhythm of the blues and how it, it, it just fit that immoral lifestyle. Uh, Robert Johnson was one of the old bluesmen. He's very famous, died young. They, they believed that he was probably poisoned by one of the women that he was cavorting with, uh, somebody else's wife, and uh, got poisoned. But uh, Robert Johnson said that he played his guitar, he played the blues. He said this, this sound affected most women in a way that I could never understand. He said, I don't know what it's doing to the women, but I really like it. It was all about sex, of course. B.B. King, B.B. King, of course, is famous in, in jazz and the blues, and he's, he also is a guitarist, but he said, the women reacted with their bodies flowing to a rhythm coming out of my guitar. And he's talking about the power, not of the words, the rhythm to affect us sexually. And that's a loud warning. The Bible says, for the, lust, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh and these are the contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And if we feed the flesh with that kind of music, then the flesh becomes more powerful. Right. I want to mention another reason why we should stay away from soft rock, and that is by listening to soft rock, you develop a taste for all the other rock. We've seen that. It's, it's an appetite. It's intoxicating. It's, it's like a drug. It's addicting. And also, number four... You have to sort through a huge amount of garbage to find a few relatively innocent rock, soft rock songs. Tons of garbage. And, and that's not a wise way to use our time. For one thing, this life is very short. And the Bible says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. 
redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We have to be careful about how we use our time. And uh, life is short, and we need to seek the will of God. And those that recommend and uh, uh, for young people to dabble around in rock and roll and find a few, few things that are sort of innocent uh, are, are causing young people to sin. And there's many that do that. One of the men that's written a lot of books on this subject, Steve Peters, he wrote the book, The Truth About Rock. He was warning about rock and roll, but he also says, well, some of it's okay. You just got to be discerning about rock and roll. And, but he, by his own testimony, said this. Just about the time I think I found a good, clean, acceptable, secular musician. They blow it on their next album or tour. And if I have recommended them, suddenly I found myself scrambling to tell thousands of teens that I was wrong. Well, you're not going to scramble and find those thousands of teens again. You think those thousands of teens are hanging on his every word to find out what's acceptable today? They are not. What the message they get from that is, hey, I could go mess around in that. And they start messing around in that, and it grabs a hold of them. And devours them. It's a green signal to young people that they can explore the filthy world of rock. And, and very few uh, young people are going to be real cautious about that. Very dangerous. But I want to mention another reason why we should stay away from soft rock, so-called. is because it often resurrects worldly memories and emotions. There are many affairs have been, uh, for independent Baptist churches, affairs, and in the world today, uh, affairs of uh, grown people, older people, getting on Facebook, getting on the internet and saying, uh, you know, I wonder about uh, what's going on about that person, the old boyfriend, the old girlfriend, which is a stupid thought to pursue. But today, uh, in the past, it wouldn't matter. You, you don't live there anymore, usually, and you're not ever going to see that person again. But today, boom, you're online. You can find that person right there. And, uh, and then uh, the, they start communicating. And, and many times, fornication and adultery happens. Number six, we must be concerned about our influence on others. Soft rock. If I listen to soft rock, it's possible, even probable, that my influence will encourage others to listen to music that is worse. And maybe I am very careful. I only listen to three or four old songs. I listen to four or five old songs. Boy, I'm just really careful. Maybe so. I doubt it, but maybe so. But the people that hear me listen to that stuff, how careful are they going to be? And young people. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Paul said, it's good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. And so, several reasons why we should stay away from the soft rock, so-called. There's another challenge that has come up. And uh, Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California, the author of The Purpose Driven Church, said that God loves all kinds of music because he invented it all. Fast and slow, loud and soft, old and new. You probably don't like it all, but God does. That's the stupidest statement. Since when did God invent all music? Men invent music. Does he think all men are directly hooked into God? Getting their inspiration directly from God? Surely he's not that, that stupid. But that's, that's, that is his, the basis for his philosophy that he can use any music. The, the Bible says God is holy. What kind of God is he talking about? 
Did he forget that this world has fallen? Did he forget that the devil's called the God of this world? Does he not believe those things? What is he talking about? I have no idea, to be honest with you. I don't know what the man's talking about, but millions listen to him. We can't get two preachers to come here, but millions listen to him. Millions. John said, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. If the devil is not in the music business, he has neglected one of the most powerful influences in modern society, and I don't believe the devil is neglectful. That's another positive thing about the devil. He's not neglecting anything that would destroy, destroy the work of God and destroy mankind. Raging in hate as he is, and uh, being as clever and subtle as he is, he certainly has not neglected the music ministry. In fact, the devil's more in the music ministry in this world a lot more than God is. What a strange statement. Didn't God create all music? There's another question that comes up, challenge that comes up, and since God looks on the heart, why are you concerned about appearance? I believe we should be concerned about appearance. And I believe it's a serious thing when the church has no standards about appearance for those that that work in the church. Now, we don't have any standards for who comes to church. I know there has been churches in the past, I guess, that have, but we don't, and and they come all kinds of ways. Every service we have in our church, there's people that are there with men with long hair and women dressed wrong and all kinds of things that's wrong, but, and we don't even have uh, standards about, you can be a church member and not really dress right, and, uh, but if you're going to do anything in the church, we do have standards. And I believe every church should, and it's a very serious issue when they don't, and they start giving those up. But they say, well, God looks on the heart. Why are you worried about that? Now, the passage that says that is 1 Samuel 16, 7, and the first thing to do when we want to figure out what the Bible's saying is to go to the context. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, what is the context here? 1 Samuel 16, 7 But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for the man looketh on for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now Samuel was looking on the uh, David's older brother, Jesse's son, Eliab, who apparently was a very impressive man. And, um, and, but, God, but God said, no, Samuel, that's not the, the man I've chosen to be king. Don't look on the outward appearance. I look on the heart. But notice here, first of all, this passage has nothing to do with dressing. We have no idea what Eliab might have been wearing that day. That wasn't the issue. He was an impressive stature of a man. And, uh, but also, we also see here that man looks on the external. And so we are supposed to care about the outward appearance because we deal with men every day. So this passage refutes what it's supposed to be proving if we look at it. And look at the context. God's word has something to say about man's dress and appearance. When Adam and Eve sinned, one of the first things that God did was to clothe them properly. They were clothed by their own standards, but God didn't accept the fig leaf clothing. And he clothed them in robes, coats, and uh, also translated elsewhere, robes, fully clothed them. Right away, we see that God does care about what man wears and how he appears in public. And uh, Jesus warned in Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So, 
It's very important what we wear as far as man goes. God's not affected by it, but that's a whole different story. And uh, we know that a person can be right in his external appearance and not be right with God in his heart. We know that. Boy, you can be spiffy and just the epitome of a good independent Baptist, an old-fashioned one, and, uh, and be rotten in your heart and be cardinal and backslidden or maybe even be lost. We know that. But when a person is right with God internally, he or she will be concerned about dressing modestly and not causing others to offend and stumble. I certainly didn't have any concern about that until I got right with the Lord. I didn't care what anybody thought about anything and certainly not how I looked. But after I got saved, I had a change of attitude. And I did not any longer delight in offending people. <laughs> and I want, and I no longer was insubordinate. I wanted to try to submit to authority and, and not offend people. And so, God does look on the heart. And man does look on the outward appearance. We can't even see the heart. There's another challenge. They say, well, since kids aren't listening to, to traditional Christian music, shouldn't we use rock to reach them? Apparently, that's how Calvary Baptist Church of Normal, uh, Illinois, began one of the turning points, I guess, of their path to contemporary, using Christian rock into services. They had a ministry to the college, and they used Christian rock to reach the young people. Well, first of all, the lost are reached not through music, but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through the preaching of the gospel, through the foolishness of preaching. It's a gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. But also, obedience to God does not allow us to use the world's music and methods. God forbids it. It doesn't matter if it might make sense. God forbids it. Romans 12, 2 is enough to tell us that. Be not conformed to this world. God forbids us to use that. It, it, it's inconceivable to think of the apostles using something like that to reach the world of their day. Some old raunchy pagan music. You can get out there and put on a raunchy, uh, uh, some kind of raunchy pagan show 